Well, blessed Sunday to you. It is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, but it is also Reformation Sunday. Now, there are a lot of contradictory emotions that go along with Reformation. One is, of course, that we, we remember and honor and to some extent celebrate the truth that Martin Luther stood on on that day, very famously on Hallow's Eve, Halloween. 1517. He believed that he was understanding and coming to terms with what the Bible taught, and so he wanted to have a discussion that later led to a reform of the church. Unfortunately, because of the developing escalation of things beyond even his own expectation, it turned into a great separation of many Christians from one another a separation that in some ways has brought a lot of diversity to the body of Christ, but in other ways has also meant a need to bring us back together. And so in 1999, there was a, a celebration of a common understanding, at least between many Protestants, specifically Lutherans at the time, but we've later been joined by many Calvinists and also by many Methodists that this is a time of coming back together with the simple understanding that grace is a gift from God, not something that we earn. Now, we still have differences on how we apply that grace to our life, and we still will continue to have more discussions. But one of the key things to remember on this day, that we both remember and honor the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And we remember that we still are challenged to do things for ourselves on our own and reject this grace of God. And so we'll be reflecting upon a lot of these things as we hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 22, as we reflect even on some of the commandments from the Old Testament in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and others. But let us gather together knowing that God's grace saves us and to remember that this grace lights a fire in us so that we too can love God and more importantly, love our neighbor as ourselves. We'll be reflecting upon this and we'll be asking ourselves, how are we doing in our confession and receiving God's absolution? And so we begin in the name of the blessed Holy Trinity, one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of overflowing grace, we come to you with repentant hearts. Forgive us for shallow thankfulness. Forgive us for passing by the ones in need. Forgive us for setting our hopes on fleeting treasures. Forgive us our neglect and thoughtlessness. Bring us home from the wilderness of sin and strengthen us to serve you in all that we do and say. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given us his son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. And so, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of your sins, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? O oh Lord God, you are the holy lawgiver. You are the salvation of your people. By your Spirit, renew us in your covenant of love and train us to care tenderly for all our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson for today comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 2, 15 through 18. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. 
You shall not be partial to the poor, shall not be partial to the poor or defy the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, and you will incur you will incur guilt upon yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Our gospel today comes from Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 34. And just say it's a continuation of the challenges of the Pharisees as they were challenging Jesus earlier regarding the coin and also the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees have left and now the Pharisees are joining in on their question to tempt Jesus to say something that they, he can be arrested by. Verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is the law of the law is the greatest? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This, com this is the greatest and the first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord? saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. My friends, this is the good news, the gospel of the Lord question I have before you today. Do you procrastinate when it comes to asking for help? I would say that I find myself doing that many times. Sometimes it's, and many times as I get older, it's pride. I think that I have walked the earth 52 years, which I have, but I think that I should have some skills, and I think in my mind that I have some skills that I really don't have. A lot of times it has to do with things around the house, needing help from friends and neighbors. I'm usually one of the last to contact sometimes because I think, or I try to tell myself, I can do it all. But what it turns out to be is a self-delusion. Now, the reason why I bring this up, and I think I'm not alone in that, is that I think many of us do this in regards to things of this life, but when it comes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the questions that they pose to Jesus, they're at least not wanting to be genuine in their need for God. They are trying to show their knowledge of Scripture, which, of course, Jesus sorely embarrasses them. But more importantly, they are not really looking for an answer. Jesus calls them out on that. What they are doing is trying to justify themselves or look good to think that they are the smart ones in the room when they are far from it if we look at the passages we have today. 
They have already been silenced by Jesus' presentation of the coin of Caesar. Jesus has already silenced the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection and seem to have made his point. And so now they get to the weightier matters of the law that they should be experts in. What is, what are the greatest commandments? And this was no small thing to think about. Both scholars say that there are, according to Leviticus, and to the law, around 612 commandments. It depends on how you parse each one. We also have this phenomenon in our own day. Just go through statutes from your state, or even federal statutes from our nation, and you'll find that we too have a very complex, and some may argue unnecessary, burdensome, statute list, where we get caught up in the minutia, when we really should be asking, what are the core things that I should get out of these sections of our state constitutions or federal constitution? And so we talk to lawyers, and they simplify things for us. And so for many years, and even, even in many religions, there was the tendency to say that there are two great commandments by which all the other ones kind of feed off of. Love of God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loving our neighbors as ourself. Now throughout the history of religions, there's always been a tendency to prioritize one versus the other, even though they have been two great commandments. And a lot of times people will choose God first. No kidding. They'll go to monasteries so that they don't have to worry about the things of this world. And in fact, that was one of the things that Luther challenged in the Reformation was whether one is more spiritual if one went to a cloister to pray, which he did. And what he found is that sin was even a greater issue before him. What he found was a community in which he both got along and didn't get along with other new neighbors who were on this same pursuit of putting God first. And I think some who are of a cloister mentality, who are monks, would say that, yeah, it's more that you seek God and seek God alone. You find yourself within a community of people and have to worry about those who are next to you as much as you worry about your relationship with God. You can never separate the two. And so a tendency came in the Reformation, and I think it is important in Jesus' focus that we need to first prioritize love of neighbor before we prioritize our love for God. In fact, we might even find the key to loving God is loving our neighbor. And as it says, as ourself, or in John's gospel, as Jesus would have us love our neighbor. We cannot escape the two, and we should prioritize our neighbor before God. First John puts it simply, how can you love the unknown God when you can not love the neighbor who is very visible to you and is known to you? And that is probably precisely the issue. Do you know my neighbor? They're not very lovable. Or maybe they're not the right kind. Fill in the blank of what that might mean. And we, of course, start to know that we are trying to justify ourselves of why we are not following the commands of loving our neighbor because we think that they are too unlovable or the burden to love them is too great. A lot of our debates focus on the love of neighbor. In fact, that is. I believe, the religion of Christianity. Well, can I tough love them and say not today? But my question to you, if you say that quite readily, maybe, 
Are you expressing love or are you trying to get out of a jam of doing the right thing? Because I find myself in the latter, the more I justify the reasons why I should not give, why I should not participate with those that are inconveniencing my life, my country, or even my world. There's a lot of inconveniencing interruptions right now. And we might ask ourselves, how can a person love in such a world as this? And we can only do it if we ask for help from the Holy Spirit. Ask for help from the gift of Jesus. And that's what Martin Luther discovered, is that grace is not something that I can self-generate. Grace is something that I need to receive from above. It is first a gift before it is an empowerment. And if it is not a gift, it's something that falls very short of the true grace, the true love of God. It might even become an idol that we think that we have earned enough points so that we can operate on our limited grace rather than God's unconditional grace. And that's where the intriguing priority of loving others as you love yourself comes in today. Because if we truly know ourselves, we might think that we continue and fall short of the glory of God. If we know ourselves, maybe it's not so much the delusion of thinking that we're okay in this world, only to discover our spouse or maybe even our parents or maybe even those close of us who know us more than we would like to be known. Not our best side, but our real side. They start to ask the question, and we start to ask the question, am I lovable? Am I a person who deserves the grace of God? And the thing that we have to get ourselves around, and it is not just mere positive thinking or self-esteem, it is simply that God has chosen us in with our foibles, in with our sin, and calls us to greater things with other fallible people who are difficult to love to be a community called the body of Christ. And while the Reformation caused a great splintering of the great denominations of the world, if you think that there are numerous of them, I have it in my one of my papers is a five-page thing from Minneapolis, and it had all the denominations celebrating, or all the churches in Minneapolis celebrating Easter. And I thought I knew my city until I saw those churches that I'd never heard of, even denominations I'd never heard of, all stemmed from the spark of the Reformation, but all focusing on a unity that was not structural, not denominational, but simply one that focused on the grace of God coming to the hearts of people through the Bible and through organizing into what we perceived as the Bible was telling us to organize. Now, there was great distress in doing this. I belong to a group that believes in reconciliation with not only Rome, but all denominations is important. While we focus primarily on that first breach, we also need to be open to all the breaches of our disunity as we try to come to a unity in Jesus who loves us, who loves our churches, and yes, is still frustrated with them when they do not live out their calling that they have been given. That's why Reformation Sunday needs to be more about not just celebrating an event that happened in 1517 where Luther on the eve of all saints on Halloween nailed his 95 theses for a discussion on how to reform the church and how to ask the question of whether this celebration of all saints was legitimately celebrated or not. 
My friends, it is not necessarily a celebration of that as much as it is a reminder that the church needs to be reforming around the spark of God's grace. The spark of God's grace found and commanded in the law that we choose to ignore many times. And that we need to repent so that we can live a greater life. A loved life because we have been beloved by the grace of God. A life that lives because we have been baptized. A life that has been lived because Jesus still gives us his very precious presence in, with, and under the bread and wine. Each and every time we kneel or stand or receive his body and blood. This is grace specific. And the question we need to ask ourselves, are we going to be the stubborn one who believes that we can do it on our own? I'm always saddened sometimes when I go to deathbeds, but sometimes I get encouraged when I hear someone saying in their very last words, I have no righteousness of my own. But Jesus Christ has given me his righteousness, and I cling to that. Unfortunately, sometimes in that sadness, I get what I would consider the wrong answer. Have I done enough? Pastor, have I done enough? And they want me to say, yes, you've done enough. But what I need to say is, no, you haven't done enough. Because that is not your righteousness. And I've had the most faithful people, I know at one of their darkest moments, not want to hear that gospel. Yes, not want to hear that good news that inspired the Reformation. They want to still do their part. They still want to have their little in when it comes to salvation. They've at least contributed something to it. Am I still to tell him? No. It's having faith in the one who baptizes, the faith in the one who graces us, faith in the one who has given us his very sacrifice. It's interesting how Jesus ends this argument about the greatest commandment with the question to the Pharisees, who is the Son of Man? Who is the Messiah? And why is he called Lord, even though he's the Son of David? In, in Psalm 110, verse 1. It's because this Lord and the Son of David is the one who is the bridge between God and us, between King David and us, and why David will call his Son Lord, because he is offering the greatest gift of love, the greatest gift of sacrifice, the greatest putting of but neighbor's needs over his own when he dies for your sins and mine. The Pharisees are not buying Jesus' interpretation. Maybe some did, but they definitely are not buying his interpretation that he is this Messiah who is both the son of David and David's Lord. Throughout the commandments, many people want to serve the law, and try to fulfill the law. But more importantly, the law of Jesus wants to serve you and me. To take the worrying about, have we climbed enough, have we done enough, and simply wants to grace us and say, first the hard news, no you haven't, but here's the good news, I have a gift for you. I have a new birth for you. I have a new gift of body and blood given for you at this altar. Come and receive it. Come and trust in it. Come, and if we do, the world and the church will be reformed again. Let this spark, let this red of fire that we have on our pyramids Ignite, not just a reformation that happened more than 500 years ago, but a reformation today in our hearts. 
May it not just build our old idols of churches and structures. It blew that apart, both for good and for ill. But it ignites you and I today through the power of the word. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your love today. We give you thanks for your grace today. Let us build on this rock, the rock of our salvation. Let us build on this hope, the hope of eternal life that is found in you, trusting in your righteousness alone. Bless us on our journey of faith. Keep us steadfast to your word. In Jesus' name we pray and let all God's people say, Amen. Would you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you join with me in Psalm 1? Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat at the seat of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked, they are like chaff, which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you today on this Reformation Sunday. If you are going to join us for church, I invite you to wear red to remind us of the fire and the passion of the gospel of Jesus Christ that transformed the world and transforms the world today. Also, just a reminder that we have a church at 8.30 at East and at 10.30 at Central. Sunday schools at both places in between this Sunday. God bless you today. We trust that these continue to be uh, encouraging to you and to spur you on to greater things in Jesus Christ. Take care. God bless.